Okay, so I guess we can go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Mo Carell. I'm part of the Landscape Conservation Planning and Design Core team. And today we have a webinar for you um, for the Transboundary Madrain Watershed Pilot Area Pre-Workshop webinar put on by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Now what I'm going to do is um, unshare this one slide and then add you to my presentation here. So bear with me. Okay, so we can go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you all again for coming. If you just joined, you're on the webinar for the um, pre-workshop webinar for the Transboundary Madrian Watershed as part of the Landscape Conservation Planning and Design effort through the Desert Conservation Cooperative. And on this slide, we just have a list of our core team for you um, to orient you if you're not already familiar. We have Genevieve Johnson, who's the Desert LCC coordinator. Um, we also have Matt Grabau, I believe is how it's pronounced. I'm not sure who's our new science coordinator at the Desert LCC, and he'll be starting on Monday, and will be attending the workshop with the rest of us, and he's through the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, we have Aaron Wilkerson, who is the BLM lead on this project. We also have Louise Mitzal at the Sky Island Alliance, who is the project lead for the Landscape Conservation Planning and Design effort. Um, I have myself, Maureen, or Mo Carell. I'm a landscape ecologist at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. We also have Tawny Robertson, who is one of our um, team facilitators. The other is Colleen Whitaker, and both are out of Southwest Decision, Decision Resources. And finally, we have Sergio Avila out of the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum. Okay, so just an overview of our session. First, we'll go over the history of the Desert LCC Landscape Conservation Planning and Design Project. Then we'll go over existing pilot area resources. And finally, we'll go over what to expect in a pilot area workshop. Okay, so first we have an introduction of the history of the LCPD. Now, before we get started, um, this is when everyone please take a look at your microphones on your phones and make sure that they're muted. I'm going to go off mute. Tony, can you hear us? I can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Now I can't. So just when you want me to um, progress to the next slide, just say next slide. I can't. I, I'm not seeing your slides yet. OK, there. Now I see them. So I think, I think go ahead, Louise. Hi everyone, this is Louise Mistel with the, with the LCPD team and I'm going to uh, take over from Mo and talk a little bit about the background on where we've been and where we're going. So next slide please, Mo. So just as a reminder to kind of uh, give us a conceptual picture of what's going on, we're working toward getting to a climate smart conservation design and some of the key components to get there include uh, workshops, which uh, are coming up, and you've, some of you, many of you probably attended last year, uh, selecting pilot areas, including the Madrean, in which we're working um, today and next week. 
stakeholder assessment to understand um, who's working on what in the region and how that fits into this bigger picture. And then importantly, what are the highest impact pressures and stressors that may be interacting with climate change that we really want to be addressing as a conservation community. Next slide, please. So over the last year or so, we've been really working to set up the context for this conservation design creation through uh, design workshops we held last fall. Um, many of you I know attended the one in Tucson. This photo is from the one we held in Aguas Calientes, uh, Mexico. And so we've been working uh, through interacting with all of you to, to understand uh, shared goals and strategies to start um, developing pilot area nominations and selecting those, and to really uh, develop our understanding of issues that are facing all of you as natural resource managers and folks working on conservation in the region. Next slide, please. And and a key piece of all of this, of course, is working with all of you to, to share what we're doing with design. And um, hopefully you all are, at this point, starting to develop a little bit un better understanding of where we're going with all of this as we craft our strategies and our process moving forward. Next slide, please. So, uh, working with all of you as partners and understanding where we're going with conservation design process has been understanding what measures of success matter to this Madrean pilot area and the larger LCC. And so some of those uh, pieces are really around working collaboratively to develop this plan that can then uh, bring together resources in a new way at a, hopefully a much bigger scale to implement conservation projects. Next, please. And then uh, we've really been hearing this a lot, and it's important to the Desert LCC that we really develop lasting partnerships and create a model for how we're going to work together at this land scale over the coming decades as we respond to these big stressors in climate change. Next, please. So we'll just walk you through this, this a little overview of the steps we've been through. Um, go ahead, Mo. So as I said last fall, we had some introductory workshops that many of you participated in. And then have been working on the stakeholder assessment piece in, 20, in last year. Next. Uh, we had 12 pilot area nominations. The Madran was one that was selected, um, among others. I think there's a slide about that coming up. So next, yep, three pilot areas selected. Um, in addition to the Madran, there is one selected in the Big Bend, Rio Bravo, Low Rio Conchos area, also a binational pilot area. So a lot of opportunity there for uh, learning from the different pilot areas, how we approach these conservation issues. And then the Eastern Mojave area. Next. And then in May of this year, uh, I'm sure many of you attended our kickoff webinar for the pilot area, and we've been doing some work around um, uh, that Mo's going to talk about in more depth around uh, starting to collect data within this Madrean pilot area and the other pilot areas. Go ahead. And we are just over a week away from the workshop next week, where we'll be seeing all of you to get more in-depth um, discussion and products around our key resources in this Madrean area, our big picture goals and shared vision for the area, and getting down to some ongoing adaptation strategies, short-term strategies that we'll be working on together over the coming year. Next. Okay. So we'll pause for any questions on, on the where we've been piece here. And if you have any questions, feel free to chat, um, type them into the chat box. Colleen, are there any questions that we should address? I see no questions in the chat box and no hands raised. 
All right. Then we shall carry on. Next is Tani, who's going to walk us through the workshop goals and agenda. Good morning, everyone. This is Tani Robertson with Southwest Decision Resources. Um, I'm assuming that you can all hear me. Um, so many, you should have received uh, the participant workshop agenda already. And if you didn't, uh, we'll be sending it out again today in both Spanish and English. But basically, um, we're just going to go through quickly the goals and an agenda. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> So for the goals, um, and that we are expecting that there's going to be many participants that were in last year's uh, Tucson-based workshop. Many of you are already working in the Mediterranean area, so and we had a Mediterranean breakout group there. So we're really trying to build on what we did during that workshop, as well as kind of related uh, efforts that are going on. But we want to make sure we develop a common understanding of the importance of this uh, pilot area the Transboundary Mediterranean Watersheds Landscape, which is southeast Arizona, southwest New Mexico, and down into Mexico, which is probably a larger landscape than many of us work in uh, in our own work. Uh, next slide. And we'll have an overview of the landscape planning and design, conservation planning and design purpose, process, uh, the things that we're going to be touching on today, we'll go into a little bit more depth on during the workshop. Next slide. And with this larger uh, landscape, um, we really want to uh, get some draft shared conservation goals for these resources. Um, there are three priority focal resources, grasslands, streams, and springs, in addition to some Madrian-specific ones. But these uh, larger cross-cutting goals, such as connectivity and biodiversity and social socio-ecological services. And so um, participants will be working on, on those shared goals. Next slide. <coughs> and then we want to get into more depth on the focal resources spring streams, grasslands, and the additional Madrian-specific um, priority resource areas um, that offer more specificity than, say, just grasslands. And this is all leading towards um, uh, informing a lot of the analysis that's going to come out and creation of useful products, including spatial design and and other things that we'll be talking more about next week. So this is all just one, one step in this larger effort. Next slide. And then we will have a panel, and I'll talk about that in a second, to really look at um, those of you who are already working on implementing adaptation strategies and building on those uh, and linking those and other strategies to the shared conservation goals. Next slide. So for the agenda, uh, on the first day, uh, we'll do the overview, um, as, as I mentioned before. Uh, we'll also, so we'll get an overview of the landscape conservation planning design, the Transboundary Madrian pilot area specifically, um, work to date, um, and those kinds of things. We have a separate team working on high impact stressors and threats. And many of you may have taken the, the survey that they have been uh, distributing over the last year. Um, so we'll get an update on that and, and where we stand with, with next steps on that project. Uh, and then we'll talk about the conservation goals. And that'll be an interactive activity uh, to try to get um, larger conservation shared goals that will then be what everything is tearing off of. Next slide. There'll be breakout work, um, breakout group work both days. So on the, the vision and goals, on the focal resources, getting into more specificity, as I mentioned, um, as well as uh, reviewing the various um, additional 
priority resources that were generated last year and, and in, through other um, meetings and so that we come out with uh, more of a final list. And then we'll do some sharing back of all of that work. Next slide. So the second day, and I will say on the end of day one, we'll have a, I, well, actually, is it day one or day two? I think it's day one. We'll have a happy hour across the street at a brewery and encourage everyone to plan on being able to be part of that. Social networking is uh, and drinking is <laughs> recommended. Uh, I think it's day one, Tony. Day one, yeah. So I it wasn't in this list, but. But to note that day one, end of day one, you should hopefully plan to join us for that um, fun evening. Day two, we'll do a review of, there's a lot of different people involved in this pilot effort and the LCPD process and working on different components. So we'll get a, a brief uh, overview of what those, what's happening with the Conservation Planning Atlas, the stakeholder assessment, um, the REA for the Madrean, the data sets, VISTA tool, and, and those kinds of things. Um, and hopefully all of these will be useful to you in some way, as well as they are informing how we're doing uh, creating this design. Next slide. And then we will have a panel of uh, not everybody who's already doing implementation of adaptation strategies but um, a subset of people that will be able to share briefly what they've been um, working on. And Louise is the moderator of that panel, and we have Don Swan from Park Service, Amy Markstein from BLM, Brian Powell from Pima County, Carrie Ann Campbell with Sky Alliance, Antonio Esquier from the Protección de la Fauna Mexicana, and they'll all be sharing um, some of the adaptation strategies they've been already implementing and how they, they relate to the vulnerabilities and the goals that we're uh, working on collectively. Um, then we'll do some breakout group work on adaptation strategies. Uh, Carolyn Inquist will give a brief uh, introduction to scenario planning, uh, and, and more in-depth scenario planning will follow this workshop based on uh, the outcomes of the workshop which will be really helpful in informing um, how we decide on shared uh, strategies and, and the plan itself in light of the potential future scenarios. And then we'll do next steps and closing comments. Next slide. So are there any questions? You can type them into the chat box or raise your hand. How are we doing, Colleen? Looks like no questions. OK. <laughs> Onward, thank you. OK, great. So now um, I've just planned a little overview of the existing data resources that are available to us in the Transboundary Madrean Watersheds. And um, before I get into this, I just wanted to say thank you for everybody who did respond to that data call and um, contribute data or lend your um, expertise into where more data may exist. I was overwhelmed and surprised with, by the uh, variety of responses that I got. Um, and so the overview that I'm about to give you it touches on some of the responses, but definitely not all of them. Um, so we'll be cataloging all of the resources that were contributed to us and putting them into ScienceBase, which is a kind of a back-end way to organize um, data resources for the Desert LCC. And then we'll be streamlining um, inclusion of some of those resources into the Conservation Planning Atlas. And again, um, Amanda and I are going to be giving you an overview of the Conservation Planning Atlas at the workshop next week. So this is just a map of the, um, of the pilot area extent to remind you all, <coughs> excuse me, of the geography that we're working with. Um, and really when we got down to it, there was a couple different 
categories of available resources that, um, that were sent by that data call. One were landscape scale resources, so resources that applied to many different areas but include the areas included in the pilot area geography. We also have databases that are specific to the key resources that have been identified by the desert LCC. And again, those are grasslands, springs, and streams. And we also have access to the rapid eco-regional assessments that are um, part of the BLM's effort to really um, hone in on conservation um, uh, existing data within the pilot area and actually has a very similar extent to the pilot area that we've identified. So this will really be a big resource. And I'll be overviewing the REAs today, but then we'll be having a more in-depth discussion and presentation about these resources at the pilot area workshop. And finally, I wanted to focus a bit on camera databases. Um, of the different resources that were sent to me through that data call, um, the, probably the most common resource was from camera databases. And it turns out there are lots of camera um, programs out there active on both sides of um, the US-Mexico border. So I'll go over a couple of those programs, and then we can talk about um, next steps in that department. So first, landscape scale resources. Now I'm going to focus on two today. And one is a vegetation mapping tool that's being developed by Miguel Pagón. Um, now, this tool is not currently available, but should be available by November of 2016. And this will be an open source tool for classifying desert vegetation using satellite imagery. Um, and by open source, I just mean that it will be readily and freely available who, and to anyone who wants to use it. Um, now, with this open source resource, you'll be able to use it in both US and Mexican geographies um, to start to produce layers and classifications that are comparable on binationally. Now, in November, when this tool gets delivered to us, this is a project for the Desert LCC. Um, there will be two webinars on how to use and implement this open source tool in your area of interest. And those will be bilingual, so stay tuned for that. And when this tool is fully developed and ready for distribution, I will be sending it out to the DLCC email list. So we should all have access to that. Okay, secondly, another landscape scale resource that is available to us is time series analyses using Landsat imagery. And um, this research is being done by the Colorado Plateau Research Station, led by the US Geological Survey, or USGS. Now, what they've been able to do is um, do long-term time series analyses starting r right around 1980, where the Landsat satellites um, are directly comparable to the data that they're collecting today. And um, the researchers at the Colorado Plateau Research Station are able to customize these, analy these analyses to spatial and temporal extents based on the applied research that's going on on the ground. Now, these time series analyses are usable for classifications. So for example, vegetation classifications within your area of interest or to calculate vegetation indices, so potentially um, primary productivity, for example, on the ground. Now, these analyses were not able to be done until maybe even a couple of years ago. And that's because of recent advances in um, computing power due to Google Earth Engine. Um, so in short, all of Landsat imagery, and Landsat is a satellite that's run by NASA out of the US government. And the imagery that it takes is a 30 by 30 meter resolution pixel. And that imagery within 24 hours is processed and readily available um, for free for anyone who wants to use it. Um, now, Landsat is also directly uploaded into Google Earth Engine. And so because of this data availability that is fairly new, we're able to run analyses using um, simultaneous engines and do large-scale change, ask large-scale questions about change that we weren't able to do before. So the current areas of extent for the Colorado Plateau Research Station, you can see them here on this map. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that everyone understood that, it, that 
these analyses are not limited to these extents. Um, again, this tool is usable with any Landsat imagery, and so we can use that on both sides of the border binationally. An example of an analysis that they've already done right here on this slide, you see um, change over time in SPEI, or Standardized Precipitation and Evapotranspiration Index. This is basically an index of drought. Um, and they were able to define an extent around the Chihuahuan Desert and look at the change in SPEI over time. You can see between 1980 and 2015. And it shows a pattern, as you know, of increasing drought um, in this area. Same goes for the Sonoran Desert. Again, a decreasing trend of SPEI. -E and again, this is um, really unique in that this is a predefined extent defined by the user. And then a large scale change analysis from 1980 to 2015 was done. And you can usually run these types of um, analyses usually within a day or so. Another example of change, this is in the Colorado Plateau, but this is an example of an analysis that would be able to be done in the transboundary Madrian watershed. Um, this is a model of cheatgrass expansion, in this case over only a couple of years between 2003 and 2005. But you can see this is the beginning. And you can see cheatgrass encroachment over time. This is sensed from satellite imagery. So again, just an example of a resource that is available um, to us in this pilot area. Are there any questions on those landscape scale resources? No, well, it looks like there was a question just clarifying the coverage of the Landsat. It was, is it US and Mexico? It looks like just US. Is that correct? Um, for the Landsat data, for, so Landsat satellite imagery is available worldwide. Um, and so doing these types of change analyses are available on both sides of the border. OK. Looks like we've got a couple other people typing questions. OK, great. We can wait a second. Uh, here's one. Any possibility of analyzing pre-1980? That decade was a very wet period. Sure. So the Landsat, the first Landsat satellite was launched in 1972. Um, but really, the type of data that's uh, readily, readily comparable to the um, data that's being collected now by Landsat satellites starts right around 1980. So it's normally cropped at that date. So in short, not really. Go ahead. It, yeah. <laughs> not really. OK. Um, there's another question here. Is there a name for the Colorado Plateau Program to look at Landsat data? A uh, specific name for the program, no. There are two researchers um, readily working on this. Um, and the lead research, researcher that I'm in contact with, his name is Aaron Bunting. OK, and, and anyone whose questions are being answered, if you have follow-up, just um, please type the follow-up into the chat box. Uh, another new question, can you all share this PowerPoint after the webinar? Yes. We're also recording the webinar, so the webinar will be available on YouTube. Thank you. OK, those are all the questions in the chat box, and I don't see any hands raised. OK, great. We'll keep going. Oh, and as a reminder, um, anyone who does not have their phones muted, can you please mute your phones? OK, great. So next up, we have key resource databases for grassland springs and streams. And for those of you that were at the steering committee meeting for the Desert LCC, this will be um, a little bit of a repeat. But just so everybody is um, aware of the different resources available to them, um, the Grassland Geospatial Data Inventory is something a project that we are finishing up right now at Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Um, this catalogs spatial, spatial data for US grasslands, as well as a review of Mexican grassland resources. And that is available in Spanish and hopefully in English. So um, again, a resource if you're looking for a comprehensive review of recent work on grasslands in Mexico. Um, we also are working on a spatial analysis mapping agricultural or risk of conversion to agriculture in grasslands um, within the extent of the Desert LCC in Mexico. 
and that will be available um, eventually on the CPA within a couple months' time. As far as Springs resources, we have the Springs Online Database run by the Springs Stewardship Institute. Um, this is actually a very user-friendly database of Springs records across the desert southwest. Um, and if you visit the database, the URL is at the bottom of this screen. Um, it, has, it has you create a username and password, and then you can sign in and access the data um, within it. It stores both location data for Springs and information on Spring Health. Um, there's a couple of different tiers of data that's available um, for different springs within the, the area of interest. And what the Spring Stewardship Institute has done is um, they've developed a standardized protocol for cataloging new, excuse me, I should say springs, when cataloging a new spring that hasn't been entered into the database before. So I'd really encourage you to visit that URL if you haven't already, because there's a lot of uh, data available, available to us that way. As far as stream resources are concerned, the Desert Flows database was developed by the Water Resource Research Center, um, and this was part of a Desert LCC science project. Um, they created a spatial database of streams across the Desert LCC, and they also create a literature database of many reports, reviews, and papers, again, all available um, on request. And the URL, again, is at the bottom of the website. OK, any questions on those databases? All right. I can steer, still hear a little bit of an echo. So if anyone is not muted, if you could again check your phones. Moving on, Rapid Ecoregional Assessments, or REAs. Um, now, we talk about these a lot um, at the Desert LCC and in the LCPD. And that's because this is a really large-scale data effort driven by the Bureau of Land Management. And the geography um, area of interest for these REAs, one of them overlaps very um, cleanly with the Madrean, um, the transboundary Madrean watershed. So generally speaking, these REAs look across ecoregions to establish ecological conditions and trends using um, existing data. So this project collated existing data and then um, moved forward using what was available to them. There is no original data collection as part of this effort. Um, the REAs map and describe areas of high ecological value based on um, different sets of inputs that I'll review for you in a minute. And they help direct development activities to appropriate areas. Uh, so basically identifying areas of high and lower ecological value so that if a development needs to go in, um, we can help direct where exactly that development would go. And here's a map of the um, Madrean Archipelago REA area of interest with the hook watersheds within that green line. Now, REAs can be broken into three conceptual elements. One is a conservation element, so um, a resource that can be assessed. And this is also usually a resource of interest. Um, these can be species, or they can be ecosystems, or they can be species assemblages. We also have change agents, and those are features or processes that could drive change in the CAs. And so an example of that could be um, fire regime or change in climate. And finally, management questions, so questions that could be answered by the REA process, by the data and models produced therein. So some examples of conservation elements. <clears throat> um, on the species level, bighorn sheep would be a good, good example. Um, moving up to the community level, we have grassland bird assemblages. So not one particular species, but the community as a whole as a conservation element. Conservation elements, again, can also be ecosystems. And so in this example, we have a terrestrial ecosystem in pinyon juniper woodland, um, an aquatic ecosystem as arid west emergent marsh and ponds. 
So an example of the data that's available for conservation elements, this is a map of the distribution of nectarverse bats, and that's a community assemblage. Um, you can see the um, occurrence and absence of nectarverse bats are mapped across the area of interest for the Madrean Archipelago. An example of a change agent could again be fire, drought, or rising temperatures. And these are mapped very similarly, again, across the same extent. So now what they did in the REAs was they combined these conservation elements with change agents um, to create response mo models, so basically showing how the change agent is affecting the conservation element across the landscape. And in this example, I apologize, this is a little bit blurry. Um, you can see status of very low for nectarverse bats, between around 0 to 1 percent in the, um, sorry, not percent, but um, low status in the yellow areas, and higher, good, better status um, in the darker blue areas between 0.9 and 1. Aside from the um, conservation elements and change agents, the REA has also attempted to answer some identified management questions. Some examples of those questions are, how is the climate change in the Madrean Archipelago? This is a general question, but could be answered by um, the selection of a couple different climate variables and the mapping of those variables across the area of interest. Another example is, where can we restore grasslands from mesquite encroachment? So again, using the grassland ecosystem as an input and um, a change agent as a stressor to locate areas of grasslands um, that could be conserved due to mosquito encroachment. And finally, the REAs produced integrity assessments, um, and they did this by ecoregion. So you can see the five ecoregions that they assessed listed below. And these integrity assessments showed change in ecoregions over time. And again, used that index from 0 to 1 to assign an integrity value. So across these five different ecoregions, you have a um, continuous seamless map of um, integrity values across the landscape. So this is an example of the integrity values for one of those um, ecoregions, the semi-desert grassland and steppe again, ranging from 0 to 1. So for more information on the rapid eco-regional assessments, you can follow the URL on this slide, or honestly, you can Google BLM Madrean Archipelago REA, and um, the same information will come up. There's also a great webinar um, available on YouTube that catalogs this resource, and I think it's about an hour and a half long. And finally, we'll be hearing many more details about these resources in the pilot area workshop next week. Are there any questions about the REAs? Uh, we have a question in the chat box that says, was the Southwest REGAP used for the map? I can't answer that question, honestly. I do not know. So I would save that question for next week. Okay, I don't see any other questions. I don't see anyone typing. Oh, we've got one person typing. Wait for that to pop up. It must be a long question. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Will a comprehensive list of CEs and CAs be available for everyone attending? OK, so I assume that means attending at the um, pilot area workshop next week. I don't know exactly what our speaker has planned, but um, a comprehensive list of those is available, and I can have those prepared for next week. Just make a note of it. OK. I'm going to go online. You're not seeing my question, I think.
We can hear you. We can hear whoever you are. <laughs> yeah, I typed a question, but I guess you're not seeing it. I was curious about the uh, map resources. Was it Southwest Regap? Sure, yeah. Was the question, did they use the Southwest Regap as part of this analysis? Correct. Yeah, and I don't have a ready answer to that question. I don't know um, the extent for all of the inputs that they used in these models. Um, but I can look into that for you, and then we'll also have um, someone who helped develop these models at the workshop next week who could speak to that as well. All right, I don't see anything else in the chat box. Okie dokie. Okay. So moving on to camera databases. Um, game cameras were probably the most common monitoring technique that people told me about during the data call across stakeholders in the transboundary Madrid and watershed. And um, this had been popping up for a while, but was pretty exciting to see um, the, the variety of different things that people were using these cameras for. Um, the Guarau National Park has a comprehensive camera program um, that our postdoc on the pro project, Ashwin, also has some interaction and um, leadership in. Arizona State University has a system of cameras spanning both sides, um, so binational camera systems, including 50 cameras deployed in Mexico. Um, the Coalition for Sonoran Desert Protection, as well as the Arizona Desert Bighorn Sheep Society, also have camera systems put out. Again, um, all most of them used for identifying wildlife, um, use of corridors, as well as use of habitat. Um, and have a couple of examples of the different organisms that they were cataloging in a minute. Um, again, just a comprehensive list of the camera databases that were identified for me. University of Arizona and the US Geological Survey also have a up and running program that has received some press recently as well. Um, Sky Island Alliance is helping to organize all of these cameras and also has a database um, that they maintain. And the US Forest Service and the US Fish and Wildlife um, Service also contribute to these efforts. So really, this is just an example of what these cameras are recording. Um, they can record anything from big game using corridors or using um, pathways, or bird occurrence and absence as well. You see a roadrunner there. Um, this image is from the Bighorn Sheep Society, uh, monitoring watering areas for bighorn sheep. Another example of um, big game passage. So as part of this um, data call, um, I know a lot of you are out on the webinar right now. I'll be sending out an additional um, query for available camera data sets just to get a really good idea of what is out there and um, of the stakeholders that are active in this workshop, um, what you all are doing as far as uh, camera database and data collection is concerned. So if you did not see your organization's name on the list, um, I would love to get an email from you. And again, I'll be sending out another query um, for additional camera databases um, in the future. So aside from the resources that I have just outlined for you, I just wanted to kind of make a point to say that there are lots of spatial data clearing houses out there. And the types of data available to us seems to be endless. <laughs> um, the Department of Interior Agencies for the United States, a lot of them have um, spatial data clearing houses. You can see the US Forest Service's URL listed on this slide. Um, Conagua also has a variety of spatial data available to us, um, corridor design, conservation science partners, the protected area database, and the national conservation easement database. These were all sent to me as potential um, clearing houses or sources for many different types of spatial data. Um, and again, we'll be cataloging all of the resources that were sent um, in science base. 
Aside from spatial data clearinghouses, we also had a variety of plans um, contributed to us, and those will be cataloged as well. Any questions on those? Uh, all right. One that says, what about more formal data collection and data sets? Bird surveys, grassland plant surveys, Arizona Game and Fish Department, big game surveys, maps, bird surveys, et cetera. Sure. There was a lot of single species um, resources that were either sent to me or emails that were um, identifying single species resources. We will most definitely um, use a single species resource in the future, but that comes a little bit further down the line after the workshop where we're really working to um, use our stakeholder base to identify conservation goals and priority resources within the pilot area. Hopefully that answered, helped answer the question. OK, there's another one here. Any chance this work could include commentary about strengths and weaknesses or limitations of these data sets? Sure. Colleen, could you repeat the beginning of that question? Any chance this work could include commentary about strengths and weaknesses or limitations of these data sets? Hmm. Um, well, that's a that's a good question with probably a <laughs> bit of a complicated answer. Um, we plan to include a subset of the contributed resources in the conservation planning atlas that the Desert LCC runs. Um, in order to include those in the conservation atlas, we're going to be holding them to minimum minimum data standards or metadata standards, and so that'll include um, what the data set was created for. Um, what scale it's meant to be used at for analysis um, permissions, as well as um, expiration date of the data. So hopefully that cataloging of data will help get at the question that you just asked. And, and there was a kind of follow on to that saying, for example, Southwest Regap underrepresents rivers here. So. Sure. Um, it looks like the question about more formal data collection she says it sort of answered her question. I don't know if you just want to unmute type and just clarify verbally. Well, I just feel that there are a lot of very um, rigorous uh, data sets out there. Uh, bird Conservancy of the Rockies has done uh, very formal winter bird surveys. Arizona Game and Fish Department for grassland birds, Arizona Game and Fish Department is currently conducting breeding bird surveys in the grasslands. And I would consider these to be very valuable regional scaled data sets. And I suspect the same may exist for trends in uh, uh, various vegetative communities also. We should try to nail down that kind of resource. Sure. Um, Yep, I've been working with that data set at Bird Conservancy, Bird Conservancy of the Rockies here. Um, and so we'll definitely be including that in the larger data um, organization on ScienceBase. Um, however, again, because there's so much data out there, we're really waiting to um, identify conservation goals and prioritize conservation goals within the pilot area before querying some of those specific species resources. OK, and just an additional comment that the Habi map um, by Arizona Game and Fish is another great resource. Habi map? Oh, Habi map with a B. <laughs> yeah. Got it. <laughs> OK, I don't Thank see you. any other questions. OK, great. Well, then, if you all don't have any other questions, um, we will see you next week. Um, thank you very much for tuning in today.